Psalm 91 says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. We welcome you to People's Church this morning as we celebrate a life lived in the presence of God and in the knowledge of the life to come. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And the Apostle Paul said, we do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Grace be to you, and peace from God who is and who was and who is to come, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. We are gathered here to praise God, to witness to our faith, and to give thanks for the life of our brother, Cecil Mackey. We come together in grief, acknowledging our loss, May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restores our life. In baptism, Cecil was sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. At this time, we'll hear the synopsis for B-flat major.
Thank you, Professor Bozek. Let us pray. Merciful God, the songs within our lives are played all around us to tunes at times that we know so well we cannot help but dance and join in. And yet at other times we hear twinges of harmony that dance between our ears and call us to something new, something exotic, something exciting, something inspiring. Help us recognize that in Cecil's great life of service, he at times added his own phrasing to the melody. Other times, he helped bring together the instrumentalists and the musicians of our souls who would help educate and guide us to what is next. We are thankful that you placed him within this great symphony of life into which we are all members. And because of the opportunity to continue the song long past his passing and our own, Lord, we are truly grateful. And so in thanksgiving for Cecil's life of faith, of hope, and of understanding and education, we listen carefully to the people around us. We hope to hear new notes and new melodies inspiring us to new places, and in so doing, continue the legacy that Cecil leaves behind. Gracious and glorious God, your son continues to sing in our hearts, therefore, let us rejoice. Through your Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. I would invite you at this time, as you feel comfortable, confident, and led, to stand or stand in spirit as we sing together, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's hymn number 275, and it can be found in the red hymnals that are either in the back of the pew in front of you or underneath the pews where you are sitting. Please join and sing with that same spirit of hope.
You may be seated. Our first scripture passage today is from the first chapter of Mark, verses 14 through 20, here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. First, we have the stage set with the world context as we see John the Baptist's fate. And then Jesus comes onto the scene and immediately begins calling his first disciples and apostles. Here we have the story of these fishermen by the sea who walk away from everything to do something new. They are called by Jesus, and they follow Jesus. Hear these words. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Thank you, Brian and Judy, for the beautiful setting of that outstanding psalm. Let us pray. Gracious God, prepare our hearts so that we are always ready to welcome a new friend, to say goodbye to a loved one, 
and to live within the moment that you have given us for this particular time. Let us do both for our friend Cecil. Let us be thankful that we are able to say goodbye to him at the end of his long life of service, but also let us call to you that you would offer the welcome, the hope, and the invitation into your kingdom that comes at the great resurrection, and that allow us to cry and to laugh at the same time. In your name we pray. Amen. Timing really is everything. And the good news today is that Cecil, in his time, was called over and over again, and he responded. I am quite thankful to have spent the past seven years as Cecil and Claire's pastor here at the People's Church. But more than that, I am supremely blessed to be one of the many people around the globe who counted Cecil Mackey as a mentor, an inspiration, and certainly a friend. I still remember our last extended, meaningful conversation that Cecil and I engaged in before he and Claire departed for Florida this past winter. We had just concluded a meeting to visit with our local imam here in East Lansing over at the Islamic Center just off of campus. We'd arranged this invitation for Cecil wanted to meet the imam here in town. And the meeting ended up going many hours as we sat and talked with the imam. And I watched these two remarkable gentlemen share stories. And I tried not to get in the way throughout all of those hours of watching two experts in the art of hospitality and education share with one another what they knew. And at the conclusion of this tour of the Islamic Center and the friendship that was offered in Imam Shadri's office, Cecil and I drove back here to the People's Church. And he synthesized our past three hours into what have, could have been yet another brilliant academic essay on the potential for meaningful interfaith dialogue on campus communities between Muslim, Christian, and Jewish ministry leaders in a way that would engage students and faculty alike to embrace their religious distinctives while seeking to model authentic relationships to combat sexist, xenophobic, ignorant hate that we see in our places of higher education. My goodness, it was like watching Bach compose in front of you in midair, and the song sort of appeared over a 10-minute drive back to the church, and then he gently placed his hand on my shoulder at the end and said, and Andrew, you should write that paper. <laughs> and I promise I'll read it. <laughs> I laughed. So that's remarkable. But truly, as we bandied back and forth talking about the idea of what we'd experienced, and he was able to recognize the context of our very divisive landscape, certainly within our country and world, but particularly within places of higher education. And then to see the local example of what we might be able to do. But he went further than that. He saw his experience echoed through his wonderful knowledge and academic background as a way of speaking to the rest of the world and then trying to handpick those people around him to use their talents and skills to make something happen that would make a difference in the world. He inspired at that time and so many other times without making himself the object of admiration. He taught, as he had done so many times before, without making me, the student, feel too ignorant, but certainly in a way to make me want to learn more. And he dreamed. He dreamed of a way to make his community a better place through higher education. And more than that, he took the time to speak to me simultaneously as a friend and a mentee, as I assumed that very familiar role of yet another person who looked up to, revered, and respected Cecil so very, very much. There are decades worth of countless stories of colleagues, employees, students, neighbors, friends, and lucky acquaintances who enjoyed that same level of intimacy and who are remarkably better for it. 
Cecil's incredible life reads like a great American odyssey, to the point where it's almost absurd to imagine this teenager from Alabama could rise up through the ranks to achieve unfathomable success and influence in the world. The tributes, the eulogies, the obituaries of recognition from around our globe are a testament to his achievements as an educator, a public servant, and a guide to so many. But further, there are innumerable untold sagas about interactions and inspirations found in Cecil that echo in the hearts and minds of sisters and brothers from country to country, both alive and those who now rest as well from their labors and who enjoy the same peace that our friend now experiences. And that rest is very well deserved. For Cecil never led a life apart from activity, adventure, travel, and constant service. I used to love to hear Cecil tell me about the way his career and life had taken so many twists and turns in unexpected and so many unplanned yet extraordinary ways that it felt almost surreal, as though you were writing the story as though it could happen, but it did actually happen in ways that you couldn't truly write out and map for yourself as a young person. To read his CV is to be astounded by his academic and professional prowess, but a resume only scratches the surface. For each move seems to have been made out of a sense of responsibility and a response to a gentle nudge, a little guiding, a tug from yet another admirer or mentor or mentee who saw potential in Cecil or an institution that afforded him yet another unexpected and remarkable stop along the way, be it Alabama, Illinois, Harvard, Colorado, Florida, Texas, or our beloved Michigan State University. Over the past few years, as I was reassessing my own call, my place within my ministry career, and contemplating next steps for my family, for where I might be called to go, Cecil was the perfect conversation partner. He was a delightful congregant who would always provide kind, thoughtful commentary and feedback on my sermons and teachings, and he would do so even when I delivered a horrible sermon, find something joyful in it and say it in such a way that I was able to hold my head up high yet still know I've got to do better next week. He encouraged me personally to accept new responsibilities, offers, and opportunities wherever they came. For, as he told me, you never know when they will come again. He advised me, and I have an email that I look back on in preparation for this very solemn day, yet celebratory moment, when he told me to work to my own strengths, but also to the strengths of the community around me. Enjoy where I am and look to make that community better, but see an opportunity to make another community better as well. He was on me, along with many other congregants in this place, to finish my own doctorate, which I sadly finished this past spring, spring after my friend had already passed away. Likewise, I announced my call to leave this church and enter academia as an educator, chaplain, professor at Alma College. Claire and Cecil were two of the people I most desperately wanted to celebrate with first when they returned. For I know they understood the difficult decision that it takes to leave one place and go to a next, and how necessary it is to be united as a couple, to understand what the needs of your family are, but also to see the higher calling that God is placing in your life. For that was at the heart of Cecil's own journey. He went when called, and he went with enthusiasm, with talent, and with inclination for the task at hand, whether it meant working with the federal government, large universities, higher education, the United Arab Emirates, or creating an entirely new way of learning for the newly established United States Air Force Academy. Any one of those would be enough to write volumes on what he had accomplished, and yet you put them all together, and they still barely scratch the surface. He went because he accepted an invitation from an Alabama senator to talk. He went because he was needed. He went because someone recognized something good in him. 
He went because he fell in love with an equally remarkable Illinois co-ed who changed his life for the better in a way that is more important and more honorable than any degree or any recognition. Claire, the gestures made in honor of your husband's service are nothing compared to the testament of admiration I offer to you regarding your truly noble relationship, a true partnership built on respect, mutual care, affinity and love, and a unity of spirit that I will confess my own wife and I observed with envy after having dinner with you one time at your place. We went home and said, that's what I want to look like 40 years from now. I say that in public to embarrass you, but I'd say it in private as well to build you up. Truly, we watched. You laughed, you teased, you told old stories, you corrected one another. You had devotion for one another, to your children, to your grandchildren. And that's far more important than any of the other honors we talk about. For in spite of all of the wonderful things we can say about Cecil's professional references and accomplishments, it is this legacy left in front that means far more. And for all of us, the friendships we leave behind, the family that we watch go on as a legacy, that, that means more than anything we can possibly accomplish in an institution, in a government, and in this world. Cecil was a man of deep fidelity and faith, and I am honored to count him as a brother in Christ, to recognize him sitting in this congregation. And as a small aside, and also to make it a little more personal, we were also fellow Sigma Chi fraternity brothers that we had talked about occasionally. And I share the words from our sacred initiation with that great brotherhood of other collegiate men by saying the white cross remained much brighter and shined much more inspiringly through Cecil's life and faith in the classroom, the boardroom, the church room, but especially in his own home. The scripture passage today from Mark introduces us to Jesus' first followers, these fishermen by the side of the lake, and we often talk about them as though they were uneducated country bumpkins. In reality, these men were existing in the midst of a small family-owned business, we see them here in Mark with employees of their own, with their fathers nearby, and we see hope for them that they could stay right there by the Sea of Galilee. They're out of the way of the Romans. They can probably worship how they want, raise their own families there in peace and quiet. There's not the thought that they will suffer the same persecutions of those in the large cities. And yet, Jesus walks by them and says, follow me. And in an instant, these young men drop what they have and what they're doing, and they take a chance and go. They leave behind the comfortable, known existence and future that they are promised for the potential of something so great, but also so very terrifying. I have to imagine that Andrew and Peter and James and John's parents watched them and wondered and worried and thought, where are you going? Just stay here and keep fishing. But instead, they went. How many times do you think Andrew and Peter threw those same nets into the same part of the lake until that moment happened? And how many other people were walking along that same lake shore, fishing in the same piece of water, and offered the same greeting to Jesus, but how many others did not accept the call to go? Jesus asked them to do something different, and their great act of faith is that they went. To stop in the midst of the ordinary, the regular, everyday work, and to do something entirely different. That is a call from God. And there is movement in that call to go. And rarely is it to go and stay in the same place and keep doing what you've done. Claire, you and Cecil followed God's call in your life to go. You were constantly going from one place to the next. And the world is a more remarkable place because you did. Cecil leaves behind an example of faith in Jesus Christ that allowed him to trust, to humbly worship wherever he was, 
and to go work with people who were different from him in so many ways, yet seeing them as equally human, equally created in God's image, equally deserving of love and a better life in spite of their race, of their religion, of their ethnicity, of their country of origin. He went, and he went to them as family members in this great kingdom that God is still creating. And he worked out his faith with fear and trembling in the midst of that great service. And I am forever grateful to have benefited from his leadership, guidance, and education, as so many others were. And I admit, walking now on a campus and having the chance to interact with students, I want to be known the same way, and I want my students to be known the same way wherever they go, and my children to be known the same way for taking the time to care about the individual, for speaking beyond generalities and surface-level conversations, for engaging in deep, authentic dialogue wherever you are and with whomever you are with, be it your granddaughter, your graduate student, or your professor emeritus, to be able to speak to them as created creatures in God's image who have the potential for such great things. Let us all live a life that inspires that type of legacy now and forevermore. Amen. Would you pray with me? O oh God, from the dawn of the first day, you have cared for your people. By your hands we were created, in your hands we live, and to your hands we return again. You have revealed yourself in many ways until in the fullness of time, your word was made flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ our Lord. In his life, death, and resurrection, we find our calling in this world and our hope for the world to come. We give you thanks for your servants who having lived this life in faith will live eternally with you. We especially thank you for Cecil, for the gift of his life, for the grace you have given him, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful. We thank you that for Cecil, death is past, pain is ended, and he has entered the joy you have prepared in the company of all the saints. Give us faith to look beyond touch and sight, and seeing that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, enable us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Bring us at last to your eternal peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
outstanding. We close our service in two parts, with a commendation for Cecil's life, not that he be recognized by God, but that we are reminded he is recognized by God in this place and in all times. And then at the conclusion of the commendation, our benediction and blessing is offered to all of us who live and continue to live, that we would take this blessing that we knew through Cecil's life and continue to live it out in our faith. Let us pray. Merciful, almighty, and gracious God, you are always forgiving, always welcoming, always loving to us. Therefore, in this particular time and place, we turn our hearts to you and incline our minds so that we might better understand that you truly have embraced your child, your son, your servant, Cecil. Help us all remember that he was a child in your family, a lamb in your flock, a sinner of your redeeming, through your grace and through your sacrifice, Lord, we know that he truly is now at rest and we will all be reunited at the great resurrection when there will be no more pain, no more tears, and no more death. Until that time, Lord, let him sleep with peace and let it be like the twinkling of an eye before we are all reunited again. In that time, help us to remember these great words that you have offered to us that you were willing to come into our world on our behalf, on behalf of Cecil, that you were able to live in this world amongst your people with your brother Cecil, and that you died and were resurrected on behalf of all people in this world and even on behalf of Cecil Mackey. Therefore, we rejoice even in the face of death. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who gives us life, we pray. Amen. And as we live, we leave this place, and we go to wherever we are called. I do not know where your next adventure will take you, friends, but I do know that God is next to you, nudging you, encouraging you, and calling you to something new, something exciting, something built on love and grace with the people around you. Therefore, go from this place with the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the community that surrounds us through God the Holy Spirit, both now and forevermore. Amen.